Greetings everyone on this coffee shop Thursday, Thursday, oh well, the last Thursday in February and then maybe we can clear out all this snow and start enjoying the wildflowers and the, and the ones that we've planted too, the crocuses and the tulips and all that, who knows, then again we might be in for a bunch more snowstorms, but here we are, we're enjoying our cup of coffee mm. ah, good stuff and we're talking about the gospel lesson that's coming up this Sunday it's the one in the gospel mark where Jesus for the first time foretells of his coming uh, trials and death and resurrection of course the disciples don't want to hear about that in fact they only hear the first part about the trials and his death and they kind of ignore the resurrection part because I think they, they've already shut their ears off at that point. But also, they don't understand. They just don't understand. But something that uh, comes up in that is a phrase. What's that over there? Yeah, Jim, what is that? Oh, Jim wants to know why Jesus keeps referring to himself as the Son of Man. Because isn't he the Son of God? Well, hey, that's a pretty good question, Jim. And there's a very good explanation for that. And it gets a little wild as well. You see, Son of God and Son of Man are two terms that you'll find scattered all through the Older Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures. And um, they can both refer to just normal human beings. Sometimes they're in references to to angels and sometimes they're in reference to something else so let's just uh, focus on the son of man one because that that's the one that's Jesus prefers to use of himself in the gospel of Mark in fact Jesus doesn't like calling himself the Messiah and if anything he keeps telling his disciples shh don't use that word you know be quiet don't say anything about that because it's Messiah has the connotation of a king and one who has power and rule over um, a nation or over nations it's in case of an emperor who has a quite an, an empire right no Jesus prefers son of man and when people would hear that term son of man boy their ears would perk up and why is that because the son of man again that's used in the Old Testament um, numerous times to talk about just a plain old human being, but also at other times a, a special human being, one who has a, a special part in God's plan of redemption of his people. Uh, it becomes very clear when you get into the book of Daniel, where the Son of Man there becomes an apocalyptic figure. What do we mean about that? One who ushers in the, the end times of God and puts everything right. And by end times, we don't mean, hey, the end of the world and there's mass destruction and things like that. No, what we mean is God stepping in and once and for all putting things right. But the Son of Man would be a human being who was appointed and anointed by God to do just that. That's what you see uh, starting to... Uh, pop up there in the book of Daniel and and remember that's written just a couple centuries before Jesus um, so it's a, it's a very it, it's very clear in the minds of the people but also there are other writings that point in that direction too writings that we don't have in our Bible but other Christians around the world do have it in their Bibles and in some instances, even some of these books are found in the Jewish scriptures as well. If any of you have a friend who is a uh, Roman Catholic, you're going to see the books of the Apocrypha. And these are, for the most part, they're intertestimonial, intertestimony, let's get it right, okay? Intertestament uh, books that were written between the times of the Older and the New Testament. Okay, got it? All right, so we have that going on. And within those books, there's a whole lot of reference to 
the Son of Man, the Son of Man being that one who does come to do God's will and put things right in this world, not as a conquering king, but as one who comes with God's authority and God's authority to really change the world, but not as a political figure. All right. That's why Jesus preferred to be called the son of man. There's one book that really fleshes out who the son of man is. It's the book of Enoch. It's one of those books of the Bible that we don't have as Protestants. And it's, it's a book that is often called a deuterocanonical book, meaning second canon, that it, it, it appears in some sh way, shape, or form, but not in our, our particular body of scriptures, but some people hold them to be divinely inspired. All right. Um, uh, pseudepigraphal is another term that's used for them because they, they were supposedly written by Enoch. Enoch, who was either the grandfather or the great-grandfather of Noah. So that's kind of crazy, right? So that would have been way, way, thousand plus years earlier not than, than Jesus. No, 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 that's not true either. It was probably written around the first century BCE. In, in that time frame, maybe even a little earlier than that, but that's the general time frame. But again, the Jews were very familiar for with that. The early Christians were very familiar with that writing. They all used it in their worship times and in their study times. Yes, they did. In fact, when you look at the book of Jude, you're going to see a big chunk of the book of Enoch that is um, alluded to and even quoted in there. And so that made it into our scriptures. So you have all this going on. And, and the other thing about the book of Enoch that's kind of crazy is we're pretty sure, most scholars are almost 100% sure it was written in Aramaic and in Hebrew. But we have only bits and pieces, fragments of, of that that remains. Our best copies of it are Ethiopic, meaning from Ethiopia. So it was written in that language, and it's a very difficult language to try to put together. And if you were to see it, and the way their alphabet is, you would just go crazy. It looks like a bunch of our modern-day emojis. Um, and the thing is, I have uh, my all-person -pers who's the expert on, on Enoch here with me right now. Okay, she's trying to get a word in, but I'm not going to let her do it right now. Anyhow, let's just make a long story short. The book of Enoch, even though it's not part of our scriptures, is important for understanding the term son of man. And that's why Jesus preferred to use that. He wanted to move people's thoughts away from the idea of a king, which is political, which would rub the wrong way, the Roman authorities, and more toward God's special person who was here to set things right again. So good question, Jim. It's a good question. And it does get a little compli complicated. And if we really wanted to dig into the Son of Man concept, we would be here for a couple hours because there's a lot of scripture passages and you have to look at each one of them individually, try to figure out, hey, how that fits into the scheme of, of what God is doing uh, with the people, with the Hebrew people back there in the Older Testament. All right, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this passage from Mark. It's the eighth chapter in which Jesus makes his passion prediction, the first one of three, and what that means not only for those disciples back then, but for Jesus' modern-day disciples, you and me. God's blessings be with you. Say hi, Berta. Say hi to everybody. Yep. Yep. My my pal, my my companion in studying all things Enoch. God's blessings be with you.